they, they normally happen, these career crises, um, uh, often actually on a Sunday evening, just as the sun is starting to set and the gap between my hopes for myself and the reality of my life start to diverge so painfully that I normally end up uh, weeping it into a pillow. I'm mentioning all this. I'm mentioning all this because I think this is not merely a personal problem. You may think I'm wrong in this, but I think that we live in an age when our lives are regularly punctuated by career crises, by moments when what we thought we knew about our lives, about our careers, comes into contact with a, a threatening uh, sort of reality. It's perhaps easier now uh, than ever before to make a good living. It's perhaps harder than ever before to stay calm, to be free of career anxiety. And I want to look uh, uh, now, if I may, at some of the reasons why we might be feeling anxiety about our careers, why we might be victims of these career crises as uh, we're weeping softly into our, our, our pillows. One of, the reasons, um, one of the reasons why we might be suffering is that we are surrounded by snobs. Um, now, in a way, I've got some bad news, particularly for anybody uh, who's come to Oxford from abroad. There's a real problem with snobbery because sometimes people from outside the UK imagine that snobbery is a distinctively UK phenomenon fixated on uh, country houses and titles. The bad news is that's not true. Snobbery is a global phenomenon. We are a global organisation. This is a global phenomenon. It exists... As, what is a snob? A snob is anybody who takes a small part of you and uses that to come to a complete vision of who you are. That is uh, snobbery. And the dominant uh, kind of snobbery that exists nowadays is job snobbery. You encounter it uh, within minutes at a party when you get asked that famous, iconic question of the early 21st century, what do you do? And according to how you answer that question, people are either incredibly delighted to see you or look at their watch and uh, make their excuses. <laughs> now, the opposite of a snob is your mother. Uh, not, not necessarily... Not necessarily your mother, uh, or indeed mine, but as it were the ideal mother. Uh, somebody who doesn't care about your achievements. But unfortunately, most people are not our mothers. Most people make a strict correlation between how much time, and if you like, love, not romantic love, though that may be something, but uh, love in general, respect, uh, they are willing to accord us, that will be strictly defined by our, our position in the social hierarchy. And that's a lot of the reason why we care so much about our careers, and indeed start caring so much about material goods. You know, we're often told that we live in very materialistic times, that we're all greedy people. I don't think we are particularly materialistic. I think we live in a society which has simply pegged certain emotional rewards to the acquisition of material goods. It's not the material goods we want, it's the rewards we want. And that's a new way of looking at luxury goods. The next time you see somebody driving a Ferrari, don't think this is somebody who's greedy. Think this is somebody who's incredibly vulnerable and in need of love. In other words, <laughs> feel... Feel... Um, Feel sympathy ra rather than contempt. There are other reasons. <laughs> there are other reasons why it's perhaps harder now to feel calm than ever before. One of these, and it's paradoxical because it's linked to something that's rather nice, is the hope we all have for our careers. Never before have expectations been so high about what human beings can achieve with their lifespan. We're told uh, uh, from many sources that anyone can achieve anything. We've done away with the caste system. We are now in a system where anyone can rise to any position uh, they please, and it's a beautiful uh, uh, idea. Um, along with that has come a spirit of equality. We're all basically equal. There are no strictly uh, uh, defined uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, hierarchies. There's one really big problem with this, and that problem is envy. Uh, envy, it's a real taboo to mention envy, but if there's one dominant emotion in modern society, that is envy, and it's linked to the spirit of equality. Let me explain. I think it would be very unusual for anyone here or anyone watching uh, to be envious of the Queen of England. Uh, even though she's uh, much richer than any of you are, and uh, uh, she's got a very large house, the reason why we don't envy her, <laughs> the reason why we don't envy her is because she's too weird. Uh, she's simply too strange. <laughs> We can't relate to her. She speaks in a funny way. She comes from a sort of odd place. So we can't relate to her. And when you can't relate to somebody, you don't envy them. The closer two people are in age, in background, in, in the process of identification, the more there's a danger of envy, which is incidentally why none of you should ever go to a school reunion, because there is no stronger reference point than people one, one was at school with. But the problem generally of modern society is that it turns the whole world into a school. Everybody's wearing jeans, everybody's the same, and yet they're not. So there's a spirit of equality combined with deep inequalities, which makes for a very, can make for a very 
stressful situation, it's probably as unlikely uh, that you would nowadays become as rich and famous as Bill Gates as it was unlikely in the 17th century that you would accede to the ranks of the French aristocracy. But the point is it doesn't feel that way. It's made to feel by magazines and other media outlets that if you've got energy, a few bright ideas about technology, a garage, uh, you too could start a major um, thing. And the consequences of this problem make themselves felt in bookshops. When you go to a large bookshop and look at the self-help sections, as I sometimes do, if you analyse self-help books that are produced in the world today, there are basically two kinds. The first kind tells you, you can do it, you can make it, anything's possible. And the other kind tell you how to cope with what we politely call low self-esteem, or impolitely call feeling very bad about yourself. There's a real correlation between a real correlation between a society that tells people that they can do anything and the existence of low self-esteem. So that's another way in which something that's quite positive can have a nasty kickback. There's another reason why we might be feeling more anxious about our careers, about our status in the world today uh, than ever before. And it's again linked to something nice. And that nice thing is called meritocracy. Now, everybody, all politicians on left and right, agree that meritocracy is a great thing, and we should all be trying to make our societies really, really meritocratic. Um, there's, uh, an, in other words, what is a meritocratic society? A meritocratic society is one in which, if you've got talent and energy and skill, you will get to the top. Nothing should hold you back. It's a beautiful idea. The problem is, if you really believe in a society where those who merit to get to the top get to the top, you'll also, by implication, and in a far more nasty way, believe in a society where those who deserve to get to the bottom also get to the bottom and stay there. In other words, your position in life comes to seem not accidental, but merited and deserved. And that makes failure seem much more crushing. You know, in the Middle Ages, uh, uh, in England, when you met a very poor person, that person would be described as an unfortunate. It's literally someone who had not been blessed by fortune, an unfortunate. Nowadays, particularly in the United States, if you meet someone at the bottom of society, they may unkindly be described as a loser. There's a real difference between an unfortunate and a loser, and that shows 400 years of evolution in society and our belief in who is responsible for our lives. It's no longer the gods, it's us. We're in the driving seat. That's exhilarating if you're doing well and very crushing if you're not. It leads, in the worst cases, in the analysis of uh, uh, sociologists like Emile Durkheim, it leads to increased rates of suicide. Uh, there are more suicides in developed individualistic countries than in any other part of the world. And some of the reason for that is that people take what happens to them extremely personally. They own their success, but they also own uh, uh, their failure. Is there any relief from some of these pressures that I've just been outlining? I think there is. I just want to turn to a few of them. Let's take meritocracy. This idea that everybody deserves to get where they get to. Um, I think it's a crazy idea, completely crazy. I will support any politician of left and right with any halfway decent meritocratic idea. I'm a meritocrat in that sense. But I think it's insane to believe that we will ever make a society that is genuinely meritocratic. It's an impossible dream. The idea that we will make a society where literally everybody's graded, the good at the, the, good at the top and the bad at the bottom, and it's exactly uh, done as it should be, is impossible. There are simply too many random factors, accidents, accidents of birth, accidents of uh, things dropping on people's heads, illnesses, etc. We will never get to grade them, uh, get, never get to grade people uh, as they should. I'm drawn to a, a lovely quote by St. Augustine in the City of God, where he says, it's a sin to judge any man by his post. Uh, in modern English, that would mean it's a sin to come to any of you who you should talk to dependent on their business card. It's not the post that should count. Um, and according to St. Augustine, it's only God who can really put everybody in their place, and he's going to do that on the day of judgment with angels and trumpets and the skies will open. Insane idea if you're a secular person like me, but something very valuable in that idea nevertheless. In other words, hold your horses when you're coming to judge people. You don't necessarily know uh, what someone's true value is. That is an unknown part uh, of them, and we shouldn't behave as though uh, it, it is known. There's another source of solace and comfort for all this. When we think about failing in life, when we think about failure, one of the reasons why we fear failing is not just a loss of income, a loss of status. What we fear is the judgment and ridicule of others. And it exists. You know, the number one organ of ridicule nowadays is the newspaper. And if you open the newspaper on any day of the week, it's full of people who've messed up their lives. They've slept with the wrong person. They've taken the wrong substance. They've passed the wrong piece of legislation, whatever it is. And they're now fit for, uh, for, for ridicule. In other words, they have failed and they are described as losers. 
Now, is there any alternative to this? I think the Western tradition shows us one glorious alternative, and that is tragedy. Tragic art, as it developed in the theatres of ancient Greece in the 5th century BC, was essentially an art form devoted to tracing how people fail and um, uh, uh, also according them a level of sympathy which ordinary life would not necessarily uh, uh, accord them. I remember a few years ago, I was thinking about all this, and I went to see the Sunday Sport, a tabloid newspaper that I don't recommend you to start reading if you're not familiar with it already. <laughs> and I went to talk to them uh, about certain of the great tragedies of Western art, and I wanted to see how they would seize the bare bones of certain stories if they came in as a news item uh, at, at the news desk on a Saturday afternoon. So I told them about Othello, they had not heard of it, but they were fascinated by it, and they, I asked them to write the headline for the story of Othello. They came up with, love-crazed immigrant kills senator's daughter, splashed across the headline. I gave them the, the plot line of uh, Madame Bovary, again, in a book they were enchanted to discover, and they, put, uh, they, they wrote, shopaholic adulteress swallows arsenic after credit fraud. Uh, and then my favourite... And they really do have a kind of genius all of their own, these guys. Uh, my favourite, uh, Sophocles' is Oedipus the King, sex with mum was blinding. Um, <laughs> it's, anyway, but... At, at, in a way, if you like, at one end of the spectrum of sympathy, uh, uh, you've got the tabloid newspaper. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got tragedy and tragic art. And I suppose I'm arguing that we should learn a little bit by, uh, about what's happening in tragic art. It would be insane to call Hamlet a loser. He is not a loser, though he has lost. Uh, and I think that is the message of tragedy to us and why it's so very, very uh, important, I think. The other thing about modern society and why it causes us anxiety is that we have nothing at its centre that is non-human. We are the first society to be living in a world where we don't worship anything other than ourselves. We think very highly of ourselves, and so we should. We've put people on the moon. We've done all sorts of extraordinary things. Uh, and so we tend to worship ourselves. Our heroes are human heroes. Um, that's a very new situation. Most other societies have had right at their centre the worship of something transcendent, a god, a spirit, a natural force, the universe, whatever it is, something else that is being worshipped. Uh, we've slightly lost the habit of doing that, which is, I think, why we're particularly drawn to nature, uh, not for the sake of our health, though it's often presented that way, but because it's an escape from the human anthill. Uh, it's an escape from our own competition and our own dramas. Uh, and that's why we enjoy looking at glaciers and oceans and contemplating the earth from outside uh, uh, its perimeters, etc. We like to feel um, uh, in contact with something that is non-human and that is so deeply uh, uh, important uh, uh, to us. What I think I've been talking about, really, is success and failure. And um, one of the interesting things about success is that we think we know what it means. Uh, if I said to you that there's somebody behind uh, the screen who's very, very successful, uh, certain ideas would immediately come to mind. Uh, you would think that person might have made a lot of money, uh, achieved renown in some field. Um, my own theory of success, and I'm somebody who's very interested in success, I really want to be successful. I'm always thinking, how can I be more successful? But as I get older, I'm also very nuanced about what that word success might mean. Here's an insight that I've had about success. You can't be successful at everything. Um, we hear a lot about talk about work-life balance nonsense. You can't have it all. You can't. So any vision of success has to admit what it's losing out on, where the element of loss is. Uh, and I think any wise life will, will accept, as I say, um, that there is going to be an element where we're not succeeding. And the thing about a successful life is that a lot of the time our ideas of what it would mean to live successfully are not our own. They're sucked in from other people, chiefly if you're a man, your father, and if you're a woman, your mother. Uh, psychoanalysis has been drumming home this message for about 80 years. No one's quite listening hard enough, but I very much believe that that's true. Uh, and we also suck in messages from everything from the television uh, to advertising to, to marketing, etc. These, these are hugely powerful forces that define what we want and how we view ourselves. Um, uh, when we're told that banking is a very respectable profession, a lot of us want to go into banking. Uh, when banking is no longer so respectable, we lose interest uh, uh, in banking. We are highly open uh, uh, to suggestion. So what I want to argue uh, for is not that we should give up on our ideas of success, but we should make sure that they are our own. We should focus in on our ideas and um, uh, uh, make sure that we own them, that we are truly the authors of our own ambitions. Because it's bad enough not getting what you want, um, but it's even worse to have an idea of what it is you want and find out at the end of the journey that it isn't, in fact, uh, what you wanted uh, uh, all along. So I'm going to end it there, but um, uh, what I really want to, uh, uh, to stress is, by all means, success, yes, but let's accept the, the strangeness of some of our ideas. Let's probe away at our notions of success. Let's make sure our ideas of success are truly our own. Thank you very much.
was great. I've got a question for you. Um, that, that was fascinating. But how do you reconcile the, uh, this idea of, of um, someone being, uh, it be, being bad to think of someone as a loser with the idea that a lot of people like of, you know, seizing control of your life and, and that a society that encourages that perhaps has to have some winners and losers? Yes, I think it's merely the randomness of the winning and losing process that I want to stress because the emphasis nowadays so much is on the justice of everything. And politicians always talk about justice. Now, I'm a firm believer in justice. I just think that it's impossible. So we should do everything we can. We should do everything we can to pursue it. But at the end of the day, we should always remember that whoever is facing us, uh, whatever has happened uh, in their lives, there will be a strong element of the haphazard. And it's that that I'm trying to leave room for, uh, because otherwise it can get quite claustrophobic. I mean, do you believe that you can combine your kind of kinder, gentler philosophy of work with, with a successful e economy? Um, um, or do you think that you can't, but it doesn't matter that much that we're putting too much emphasis on that? Uh, the nightmare thought uh, is that frightening people is the best way to get work out of them. Um, and uh, that somehow the crueler the environment, the more people will rise to the challenge. Um, you want to think, what, who would you like as your ideal dad? And your ideal dad is somebody who's tough but gentle. And that's a very hard line to, to, to make. We need fathers, as it were, the exemplary father figures uh, uh, in society, uh, avoiding the two extremes, which is the authoritarian, disciplinarian on the one hand, and on the other, uh, the lax, uh, uh, no rules uh, uh, option. Alain de Botton. Thank you very much. <laughs>